feel like you're fighting for your job? Absolutely. I totally felt. Um, I mean, it's kind of part of being in the UFC, uh, being being fighting in this on this level and in this promotion. There's there's always a wonder if it's, you know, if there's going to be a mess up, if it's going to be your last chance, and so. It's like a lot of people, I feel like a lot of people get here by fighting like they have nothing to lose. And then once you get here, you're like, oh man, I got something to lose now. And so it's always a little bit of a struggle to, to keep fighting like I have nothing to lose. And I feel, I feel like it gets harder every single time a little bit because, you know, it just gets to be more and more. But um, I just embraced it. I embraced everything about it. I embraced the training camp and, and all the moments and, and the walking out. and. I was like, I'm, I'm gonna love every second of it, no matter how it goes, and and I'm glad that it worked out well. Did you? Oh, like, did, like, was this a dream for you a little bit? Like, did you love every moment out there? Like, you know, you, you sweat, you know, you go through all those training camps, but was it all for those 15 minutes? Was that? Yeah, yeah, totally. It's a, it's a lot of hard work to get right here, and this was my first time getting to fight locally ever since I've been in the UFC, ever since I moved away from Colorado. Um, seven years ago, so this was a huge deal, and, and it was everything I hoped it would be. What did you make uh, in your training camp about like her boxing, knowing that she has those hands? Is that obviously a focus that you had when you came into the fight? Yeah, totally. In the past, uh, I'm not supposed to talk about my faults here, <laughs> but in the past, I've been a little susceptible to getting kind of crazy and, and wide and just coming forward, and so it was a big deal for me to keep my aggression because it's a huge part of who I am and how I fight, but to temper that along with technique and intelligence and good timing and good movement and good distance. And so uh, we did a lot of drilling with that. I'm really lucky that one of my training partners is Carrie Melendez and she has awesome hands. She's got great stand up. And so I was able to work off of her speed and really practice dealing with someone who's as sharp and on point as um, Aldana is. What do you make of the women's 145 division coming to the UFC and the title fight that's been built? I'm really happy for them. I think it's a wonderful thing. I think that the more opportunities for the women, the better. Every single opportunity the women have had, they've blossomed in. How feminine is that term? <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've busted down the doors in. Um, but every, every chance that they've gotten, we've gotten, they, we've gotten, we've, we've done amazing things. And so it's really exciting to see what the 45 is going to hold. As far as the title fight goes, I would have been excited to see Holm and uh, Jermaine fight at 135. So getting to see him fight at 145 is exciting. You know, I have a teammate, um, uh, Kelly Fazholes, and, and I'm wondering if she's going to go to 45. I, I'm really excited to see all the different women who are going to go to 45. It was interesting. I've had some conversations where people were like, yeah, but, you know, who's actually going to go there? Nobody else really struggles. Well, just because they don't struggle like Cyborg does doesn't mean that they're not struggling. And half the point of, of being here and doing this is, or maybe not the point, but the goal and, and part of the idea is that you're acting like you're not struggling. So there's a lot of people who are struggling with the weight cuts behind doors that then I'm excited to see them uh, blossom in the 145 <laughs> division. <laughs> what do you What do you make of the whole situation with Cyborg not getting the title shot, though? I mean, you, you fought her and you trained with her. Did you? Uh, what did you think of that situation? Everyone knows her status. Everyone knows that she's the the toughest woman in MMA, and so it's not. Um, I mean, whoever gets that belt, they're they're gonna know it's something of an interim belt because. Cyborg's going to come and they're going to have to fight her before anybody really looks at them as a 145 pound title holder. And I, I get what she's saying, you know. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, if you're just watching this interview, she was saying that she was having so much trouble with the weight cuts and she gets her blood tested afterward. And then the doctor was like, whoa, uh, the doctor said her blood was too thick to take, which is interesting, but whatever. <laughs> Um, she said that it showed up badly, and, and so she didn't have enough time to adjust to a weight cut again down to 45. And it's legit. It's true. Like, weight cuts are a really, really hard thing to do. For a lot of people, they're tougher than the fight itself. And so I, I think that the most important thing the fighter can do is guard their health, that a fighter's health is the only thing that only the fighter is going to take priorities with. And so if they don't do it, then nobody else is. And so props to Cyborg for, for watching out for herself. And, and I'm looking forward to see her fight, whoever wins that fight. You went up and wait uh, a little bit to fight her. Is that, would you be more likely to move up? Or if they ever opened up a 125 division, could you go down? Uh, you know, I fought up. I fought down. I fought at 125. I fought at 40, 45. 
35. Um, I, I kind of like where I'm at right now. I feel like I've got the weight dialed in. I, uh, I like fighting 35 pound women. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with where I'm at right now. You never know, though, as far as opportunities come up. If someone drops out of a title fight and they're like, hey, make this weight and here you go, eh, you know, I'm always open to everything. But as, as far as me looking at the immediate opportunities and possibilities, I'm pretty happy where I'm at. Have you gotten a chance to talk to the uh, MMAAA people yet? You were very active on social media after yeah. it was announced. Uh, you talked about starting your own thing with Lucas Middlebrook. Wh where is that whole process with mm. you right now? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> well, we're at, I have gotten to talk to Bjorn for about two hours as far as the MMAAA goes. And I, I heard about what their plan is, and, and I, think, I think it's a good plan. Um, maybe not the one exactly that I would have chosen. And I'm also part of another group, the MMAFA. And their goal is to restore competition. Um, the idea being that since the UFC puts up the belts instead of sanctioning bodies, that it in prohibits, um, inhibits the ability of other promotions to compete. And then also by signing with the UFC, I'm inhibiting my ability to compete with other women. So it just, uh, in the same way that um, monopolies prevent um, competition, uh, that, that the way that UFC or MMA in general, really, not just the UFC, it's all of them. It's Bellator, you know, you can't fight in a different promotion for the belt. So it, the, just the idea that a restructuring of MMA is going to make everybody more money because the promoters can compete and then the different uh, belt holders can bring their different belts and, and fight against everybody cross-promotionally. And so I'm part of that group as well. But really my main focus is the fighters and so I want to find out how to get benefits for the fighters. I want to find out how to get health care. That's the number one most important thing and that's my number one focus. It's turning out to be a lot more political than I thought. I, like you mentioned I was part of the PFA working with Lucas Middlebrook before and that didn't, the, my vision of it didn't work out um, the same way that the PFA's vision but Lucas Middlebrook and I do have the same vision of a democratically structured fighter-led union and so I'm going to keep working towards that but more more than the power struggle or or the politics of it all I'm really just focused on getting insurance benefits for fighters and their families because that's the number one priority. Do you feel like that there's been an open bridge of communication between you and the organizations as well as with UFC in regards to all of this? I don't think that there has been a lot of good communication. Most of the communication as far as the unions and the associations, um, not only just between us and the UFC and WME IMG and Dana, but also between the different groups and then between all the fighters, it's mostly been facilitated by the media. So. Thank you guys all so much for that. <laughs> Just want to appreciate that real quick. But um, we definitely need to open up more lines of communication. And that's one of the ideas between um, uh, forming, forming these groups. And then I'm personally, as an individual, really working on being as supportive of the other fighters as possible and, and opening up my ears and my eyes to pay attention and listen and learn as much about them so that I can relate to them. Because at the end of the day, we, we, are, we are the sport, we're the athletes of the sport. And so we've, I feel, been prevented, um, not prevented as if someone else has done this to us, we've prevented ourselves from coming together and taking advantage of those opportunities in this day and age, 2016, we should, we should be able to band together and get some basic rights as far as uh, labor rights go. Um, and, and we've prevented ourselves from doing that because of our we're fighters, you know, we're, we're individuals, we're fighters, we, we delegate, we have to get really focused on training camps, and, um, and I think that we can do better than that. I think that we can expand and get past that and start helping each other out more. Did you, did, given your public position in support of uh, unions and collective, I, you know, collective bargaining, uh -huh. did that put any more pressure on you? Absolutely. Absolutely. When you asked me earlier if, if I felt like my back was against the wall, you, I thought, were asking because of my last uh, loss against Cyborg, but in my head, it's been, um, that was compounded by my stance, my very public stance on the fighters' associations and the unions, and 
Uh, so I definitely felt like I needed to get this win in order to keep myself in the game because I felt like I put a target on my back, which isn't the goal. For the record, I love being in the UFC. I love fighting in the UFC. I love everything that the UFC has done for the sport. I, they are the vehicle that's brought MMA to the masses, and I appreciate that. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the UFC. And, and I, I want to keep working with them. I just want to make it a fair playing ground. And I think that um, once labor issues are solved, then just like all the other major sports, that the numbers are going to go through the roof. And on a completely different topic, who do you got in the main event uh, next this, uh, later this month, Nunez versus Rousey, and why? Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, that's tough. Okay, here, I got to say this. <laughs> Look, I, I, I started off not being a Rousey fan, and then she totally won me over, and I realized it's just because I was jealous, straight up. And, um, you know, when she got that loss, I was bummed. I wish, because at this point, yeah, I, I'm all about her, you know? I think it's great. She's done wonderful things for, for women's MMA, for MMA in general, period. And so uh, I wish that they had given her a tune-up fight before this, because... Look, here's the thing, everyone's saying that it was Raquel Pennington that retired Misha, but it wasn't. It was Amanda Nunes who retired Misha, and Raquel just came back in and punched her, and she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and I'm saying that with so much respect and love for Misha, and, and I, uh, I just wish that they had given Ronda a tune-up fight before this fight, because... Man, um, Amanda is intense, and, and after losing a fight the way that she lost to Holly Holm, you know, you, I, personally, I love getting in there and fighting, but I always get worried for half a second. It's at the back of my mind, like, what if this is the fight that I don't feel like fighting anymore? And, and I think that it would be a bigger thought in someone's head if they were coming back after fighting someone like Holly, getting knocked out, and then to come up against such a power puncher like Nunes. So... I, I'm at a point now where I like everybody, so I don't really <laughs> want to like choose winners or losers. You know, when you think about it, that's kind of jerky, right? <laughs> I think you're going to be laying in a pool of your own blood. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> right? How does that work? <laughs> so I'm not going to choose a winner, but I, I do wish for uh, Rhonda's sake that they'd given her a, a warm-up fight to get back into it. But it's going to be a, a good fight. I'm excited to watch it.